Good morning, you're watching CNBC Africa with me, Kopano Gumbi. Now, South Africa will assume the chairship of the African Union this year at the 33rd Ordinary Session of the AU, taking place in Addis Ababa in February. We cross live to Pretoria, where President Cyril Ramaphosa is addressing the Africa Heads of Mission to South Africa to outline South Africa's strategic objectives for the chairship. I would like to invite the minister to take up the podium. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, could we please welcome the president once more? <laughs> so, Mr. President, uh, I have the pleasant duty along with our heads of mission uh, of welcoming you to our department and to this uh, colloquium. We're very pleased uh, that you've been able, as they say in diplomatic circles, to take time away from your busy schedule in order to join us in this important meeting. We hope that you will enjoy our hospitality and you are most welcome here. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <laughs> so colleagues, I hope you will agree that I have welcomed the President on your behalf. President is most excited to see all African countries represented here by you. And uh, it's now my honor and privilege to ask our President to address you, President Ramaphosa. Mr. President. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Minister Pando, uh, Deputy Ministers of International Relations and Cooperation, other ministers who are also here with us, and Deputy Ministers, Ambassadors and High Commissioners and uh, Heads of Mission, senior government officials who are also here with us and distinguished guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I must say it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to be with you here and also to participate all be for a little while in the colloquium that you are going to have because this colloquium is taking place at a very important moment in the life of our country as well as in the life of our continent. We're starting a new decade and we hope that this will be a decade which we could in the end call the golden decade where we will be able to achieve the many goals and aspirations that we have for each of the countries on our continent and for all the peoples who live on our continent. We meet just a few weeks before we head to Addis Ababa to attend the 33rd Ordinary Summit of our African Union, where South Africa will officially assume the chairship of our continental organization for 2020. As we all know, South Africa previously occupied this position. We had the honor of being chair of the AU in 2002 at a seminal session of that officially launched African Union. It was also there that we inaugurated the highly acclaimed New Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD. We also established the Peace and Security Council 
and adopted the Declaration on the Common African Defense and Security Policy. As we all know, NEPAD became the buzzword around not only the continent but the world because as we chaired the African Union, we were able to put on the world's agenda and the continental agenda the key issues of development for our continent. The chairship in 2002 presented South Africa with an opportunity to build a lasting legacy for the continent and our own country. Now the 2020 chairship should also present us with opportunities, albeit at a challenging time for both our country and indeed the continent. I will not go, go into a contextual analysis which I believe the minister will have done at a global and continental level Perhaps during the discussions we'll be able also to look at the political economy of our continent and do a little bit of an analysis. Because some of the countries on our continent are facing a number of challenges, both at a political and at a social level. There are pockets of instability on our continent which present both challenges as well as opportunities in a number of ways. Violent conflict continues to hamper our efforts to achieve continental peace development. As a result, certain events on the continent have tended to attract world attention, as we well know. I'm convinced that some of these occurrences need the intervention of those who are able to assist African countries to find solutions. But in some cases, these interventions seem to be driven by ulterior motives. And this seems to be the case, at least with two countries that one can highlight, which is Libya and South Sudan. And I'll come back to this. Another important issue which we need to reflect on is Africa's youthful population, a population of young people across the African continent which is impatient for change and the creation of a more development economic opportunities for them. At the same time, we are presented with unprecedented opportunities for development, most notably when it comes to the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. This is a momentous event in the decades-long effort to integrate the economies of the African continent. Later this afternoon, I'll be meeting with a number of businesses, South African businesses that operate in a number of countries on our continent. And we will be looking at how, as businesses that operate in various countries, they can take advantage of the opportunities that the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement has presented to them. For this Continental Free Trade Area Agreement will make Africa the largest common market in the world with a population of more than a billion people and a combined GDP of over three trillion dollars. The Continental Free Trade Area will boost inter-Africa trade it will reignite industrialization and where countries have not succeeded to industrialize, it will help to catapult them to the industrial era.
but it will also pave the way for the meaningful integration of Africa into global value chains and the global economy in general. This will be the moment when Africa will say, trade with us on our terms. Not on terms that have been crafted in other continents, but on terms that have been crafted on our continent. Through this period, Africa is itself diversifying its international partnerships, broadening the scope of cooperation with various international bodies and countries. As Chair, South Africa is determined to take the project of continental unity in integration development further guided by our own foreign policy priorities and the continent's aspirations as espoused in Agenda 2063. Our domestic priorities, including economic transformation, job creation and the consolidation of what we call the social wage through reliable and uh, quality basic services depend on a politically stable and economically growing Africa. Our chairship of the African Union will have an impact on all of South Africa's missions, especially multilateral missions, since our ambassadors will need to promote not only South Africa and its positions, but also the positions of the African Union. Our chairship of the continent is highly expected by a number of people on our continent. So we have to live up to a number of expectations and the aspirations that many on our continent have. This year, South Africa will also assume the chairships of the Africa the African Peer Review Mechanism, APRM, and the Committee of African Heads of State and Government on Climate Change. Both of these areas of responsibility align with our responsibilities and priorities as Chair of the African Union. At the top of our agenda as Chair of the African Union, must be the deepening of economic integration. We are going to be highlighting economic development, economic development that spans across a number of sectors. This for us is a historic moment that we must seize. As we all know, we are the most industrialized country on our continent and we need to live up to the aspirations and expectations that many have. Together with our fellow African countries, we will need to work together to implement the AFCTA with purpose and determination. We're grateful that a solid foundation has been built to have the AFCTA in place, and we therefore must begin to put up the walls that will support the trade, the integration of our continent and the economic level as much as we possibly can. We must undertake detailed work but it must be underpinned by extensive consultation and complex negotiations required to give life to this agreement. It is one thing for the continent to have struck this agreement under the leadership of President Isofu of Niger or Niger. He is the champion on the continental economic integration we will have to play a supportive role to the work that he has done. And the continent therefore looks to Africa, the most industrialized 
country on our continent to give full effect to the implementation of this agreement. This work is directed toward the social and economic development of the continent and the realization of a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Now, South Africa will need to be proactive and assertive in seeking common approaches on issues such as tariff lines, rules of origin, custom controls, trade in services, and new generation issues like competition and intellectual property. We will also need to address issues like ease of doing business in different African countries. Now this is an area where a lot of negotiation, consultation, and discussion will need to ensue. When I meet our businesses, business leaders later this afternoon, they will in the main be outlining some of the challenges that they face as they do business in various parts of our continent. And it is not like it happens only in other countries, it also happens in our own country. And it is for this reason that we are involved ourselves in reform processes to ensure that businesses that operate in our own country are able to do so without too much re regulatory red tape and too many imp impediments and constraints. So this is a challenge that spans across the whole continent. We know that the AFCTA will only become a reality if the infrastructure between African countries is developed. In the end, infrastructure is at the core of Africa's social, economic, and political challenges. It is crucial for sustainable development and inclusive growth and for diversification through industrialization and value addition that we must ensure that infrastructure is improved right across the continent. Now, as a champion of the Presidential Infrastructure Initiative under NEPAD, South Africa has a critical role to play and must act on the opportunity presented in profiling infrastructure development in support of the AFCFTA. The Presidential Infrastructure Champion Initiative aims to promote priority projects for high impact results. The initiative works with the program for infrastructure development for Africa that was adopted during the January 2012 AU summit. The overall goal of the program is to promote socio-economic development and poverty reduction on our continent through improved access to integrated regional and continental infrastructure network and services. In this role, South Africa can also develop linkages between the SADC Regional Infrastructure Development Master Plan and the Presidential Infrastructure Champion Initiative. On this basis, it is proposed that South Africa hosts a high-level forum on infrastructure during its term as AU chair. And I'd like to hear us discuss this so that we give full effect to the success of this initiative. Another pillar of South Africa's agenda as AU chair is going to be the empowerment of women with a specific emphasis on promoting financial and economic inclusion and in combating gender-based violence. 
on women's financial and economic inclusion, South Africa will work with the AU's Women, Gender and Development Directorate, which is responsible for leading, guiding, and defending and coordinating the AU's efforts on gender equality and development. We will, in this regard, work very closely with the AU leader on gender and development, President Nana Akufo Addo of Ghana, who has already launched the Gender and Development Initiative for Africa in 2017 as his flagship program. The United Nations 2009 World Survey on the Role of Women in Development notes that women's equal access to financial and economic resources is critical for the achievement of gender equality and sustainable economic growth and development. In undertaking this work, we must look beyond micro finance solutions to financing that will grow the businesses <clears throat> that many of the women on our continent are involved in and are leading. The goal is to ensure that women and women-led businesses have access to and are able to use multiple financial services as tools that help them to develop their financial autonomy, allow them to contribute to economic growth, and to enhance their own capacity to take advantage of the opportunities that the future of work will bring. The extent and persistence of violence against women remains a major cause for concern in almost all the countries on our continent. We became more sharply aware of this when we were dealing in a much more focused way on the efforts that we can take and should take and are taking as a nation to combat gender-based violence, particularly femicide, as well as the rape of women in our own country. We then realized that we were not the only country, not only on our continent, but in the world, who are having to deal with the scourge of gender-based violence. But we were quite encouraged that the women in our own country took great leadership on this matter and led the nation towards coming up with outstanding initiatives that are now being implemented to deal with this to a point where we had to hold a special session of our two houses of parliament, but more importantly that the government had to budget that we will lay out resources to deal with this scourge. In 2009, only 28% of sub-Saharan African countries had laws on domestic violence. By 2018, that figure had increased <clears throat> to 55%, which means that half of the countries still do not have laws that specifically address the most prevalent form of violence against women. During this year, we need to mobilize African countries to focus on prevention of violence against women and girls through, amongst other things, addressing the harmful social norms that contribute to and perpetuate such violence. Harmful notions of masculinity and social attitudes that accept violence need to be challenged and replaced by norms that promote gender equality, respect, and nonviolence. We also need to address discriminatory laws in African countries that disadvantage women 
and look to international instruments like the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment as means to combat sexual harassment and violence. The promotion of economic integration and respect for human rights depends in large measure on the promotion of good governance. As the chair of the African peer review mechanism in 2020, South Africa will be primarily responsible for driving the APRM's good governance agenda. The delivery of the good governance through democratic practice and economic management and growth reduces political tensions in countries with social divisions. Importantly, the APRM is now an autonomous entity within the AU structures and has expanded its mandate to cover tracking and monitoring implementation of Agenda 2063 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It has also developed an early warning system for conflict prevention on the continent in the context of harmony and synergy between the APRM, the African Peace and Security Architecture, and the African Governance Architecture. The three main priorities for South Africa's chairship, economic integration, women's empowerment, and good governance must be underpinned by the promotion of a peaceful and secure Africa. As South Africa's chairship will coincide with the end of the AU's aspiration of silencing the guns in 2020, it will be important to take stock on the achievements and challenges. This is particularly important for us as South Africa is the AU appointed champion on AU UN cooperation on peace operations. Specific focus will need to be given to two intractable conflicts, or may I say maybe what seems to be two intractable conflicts on the continent. I say this advisedly, being a country that had a conflict which the world had deemed to be intractable, which was apartheid but a conflict that was finally resolved. So these two conflicts may seem to be intractable, but I believe that their apparent intractability has seeds of solutions which we need to find. That is in Libya and South Sudan. South Africa is already actively involved in seeking solutions for these two seemingly intractable conflicts. In South Sudan, <coughs> can I buy some water here? Yeah, DJ on Rex said it's a mate. Get ten dollars. <laughs> Thanks. Now in South Sudan, we are engaged both bilaterally and multilaterally, in particular as chair of the high level and ad hoc committee on South Sudan known, known as the C five. South Africa is a member of the AU High Level Committee on Libya. Our efforts will aim at affirming South Africa's commitment to peace, security, and stability on the continent and ending the humanitarian catastrophe and displacement of people in these two countries. Since the chairship also coincides with South Africa's 
third tenure as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, South Africa should promote cooperation between the three African members of the UN Security Council and the AU's Peace and Security Council. In summary, <clears throat> South Africa's strategic objectives during the chairship of the AU are promote South Africa's values, interests, and continental and domestic objectives. To support integration, economic development, trade and investment on our continent, drive the implementation of the Presidential Infrastructure Champion Initiative in support of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, advance gender equality and the empowerment of women, and combat violence against women and girls. Strengthen cooperation between the AU and the United Nations. Promote peace and security and advance the effort of silencing the guns on our continent. Now, if we remain focused on these objectives, and they may seem to be too many, but if we categorize them properly, they are essentially three. If we fo focus on these objectives, and if we pursue them with diligence and determination, and if we mobilize our fellow African countries in pursuing them, I'm certain that our chairship of the African Union can be meaningful, effective, and impactful. And just to be sure, our chairship is a collective task. It's not only a task of their president. It is South Africa's task. And in the end, it is a much more focused collective task of each one of us as we represent South Africa in the various countries where we are deployed. It also includes our ambassador at the UN, our ambassador who represents us also on the UN Security Council. So this, colleagues, is highlighting the tasks that lie ahead for us, but it also highlights the great opportunities. As we start this new decade, South Africa opens the new decade as chair of the AU. It is a task that all of us need to take up seriously with great commitment, focusing on the various tasks that we have set out for ourselves. As I said initially, it is going to revolve, involve rather a lot of engagement right across the continent where we should speak with a number of voices but articulating one message. A message that is part of this whole task that we have set out for ourselves. And it's a real joy and pleasure for me to be amongst you as we start this new journey of being chair of the AU. And as I said earlier, a number of countries on our continent and people are looking forward to South Africa being chair of the AU. And let us go and execute this task with the commitment that we as South Africans are known for, a commitment which is underpinned by hard work focused determination which South Africans are known for. Thank you very much.